Please welcome Lucy Bernholz. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the plenary on data and democracy. Who says digital tech are democratizing? Uh, I'm Lucy Bernholz from the Digital Civil Society Lab at Stanford. It's my pleasure to be joined on stage by Stephen King, uh, CEO of Illuminate, Sander Letterer of uh, K-Monitor, the founder, co-founder and director of K-Monitor, and Sean McDonald, who is co-founder of Digital Public and CEO of Frontline SMS. I want to also welcome our live streaming audience and encourage all of you who are tweeting to use the hashtag GPF19. So we're here, and I'm, uh, the, the, the conference as a whole is talking about reclaiming democracy. The title of this session is Who Says Digital Tech Are Democratizing? I want to actually start by getting a little honest. I think it's probably fair to guess that just about every single person in this room until a few years ago would have been in the camp of those who say digital tech are democratizing. There's been a real sea change of awareness by many of us about the challenges of digital technologies and the challenges they may actually be playing for our democracies. But we also have to be honest about who's known this for a very long time. There are very important populations of people in our democracies who've known for a very long time that digital tech came with all kinds of limitations. I think specifically to the night that Mike Ferguson was murdered on the streets of Ferguson, I'm sorry, that Mike Brown was murdered on the streets of Ferguson, Missouri, and within hours there was a very clear line of communication that what was being talked about on Twitter was not the same as what was being talked about on Facebook, was not the same as what was being covered in the broadcast media, and thus was content moderation brought to the public eye. But there's other people who've been aware of the challenges of digital technology for democracies, at least as we understand those two things. There are educational technology researchers who will tell you 10 years ago about the discriminatory possibilities. There are media scholars who've been looking at these systems for a long time. There are people, and some of them may be here in this room, who've been part of the Keep It On Coalition, which is 70 organizations around the world who've been fighting internet shutdowns for several years now. That there's sort of nothing automatically democratizing about these technologies. So what we're here to talk about today is if we've gone from one end of a pendulum to another, my three uh, colleagues here on the stage are all each directly involved in ways that are focused on, I would argue, trying to make digital technologies useful for the pursuit of certain democratic purposes. Uh, and I think we all stand to learn something from that. But before we get to my colleagues here, I wanna take this apart a little bit. Um, two phrases digital technology and democracy, because we can talk about these things at a level of abstraction that I don't think gets us very far. So first of all, and I'm gonna do this uh, partly because I'm gonna ask, uh, we're gonna talk in the conversation a little bit about what seem like either polar opposites or tensions, and I wanna just put some of the language out on the table here. When we talk about democracy, people have in their minds all kinds of things, from, the, from basic freedoms, from freedoms that are protected protected in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to expression and association, to privacy. Those are important values. They also, you might have in your mind sort of principles of democracy, whether that be about uh, participation or accountability and scrutiny. And we'll want to think about where technology fits in on those things. And then we'll, there's also core social values at work here, sort of muddied into the definition or to the catchphrase democracy, things like, oh, I don't know, justice or equality. Some really important concepts that are not all the same thing. And then on the digital technology side, I, I run something at Stanford called the Digital Civil Society Lab, and we are often trying to get people to really come back with us to the very beginning, to the very first principle, um, and to understand that in the two things. One, we live in an age in which we should assume digital. We should assume that these technologies, this whole system from data to the political economy of the companies is at work 
in whatever we're doing. And secondly, that digitized data as an economic resource are as fundamentally different from money as, as water is from land. You heard Jeremy and Asha and, and, and Kathleen Kelly talking about um, current versus currency. Far too many of our sort of frame limiting um, misassumptions have been based on the idea that we can use data like money. That's not to say you can't make a whole lot of money off of data. Welcome to Silicon Valley. We've, people have figured that out, but they are, da digitized data and money are two fundamentally different things. They're different economic resources. At the lab, we think there are four domains of change that we all need to be engaged in as we try to adapt to this fundamentally new, fundamentally different economic resource and adapt our institutions, including our democracies, to them. Those four domains, and my colleagues will talk about each of them, are the actual technologies, uh, things like encryption have a fundamental connection to values like privacy. There's organizational forms, and we'll hear about both whole new forms of organizations that are being as well as existing organizations like your foundations that need to figure out how to actually govern this fundamentally new resource. There are legal changes, and we'll talk a little bit about the policy environment that matters, but if you understand that you're dependent on digital technologies, then you'd also understand that the rules and regulations that shape that digital realm the policy frames of intellectual property and telecommunications are now the policy frames that matter to civil society and philanthropy. And finally, the social behavior that each of us engages as we interact with these technologies, whether that's uh, how we actually use our own telephones or whether or not we pursue some kind of responsible data practices when we're at work. So there's four domains, and the, the work that um, Stephen, Sean, and uh, Sandor are leading in cages all of them. So that's, a, that's plenty for me. Um, I wanna get right to um, my colleagues here, and the question is, uh, just to get you started, if you would each, starting with Stephen, um, Tell us what it is you're doing at Luminate on this question of data and democracy, and with a particular focus on which of those many values and challenges you are actually trying to address. Great, thank you, um, Lucy. And <clears throat> I'm just very briefly on what is Luminate. Um, we're a global philanthropic organization, which is funded by Pierre Amidia, the founder of eBay. Um, we've just been around for about a year, but we came out of the Amidia Network. We were part of the, the Amidia Network's governance and citizen engagement program. So this is, I suppose, a 10-year journey we've been on. And we were, I think, um, you, know, uh, you know, proud to say, but also kind of ashamed to say that we were one of the sort of first sort of enthusiasts in the sort of philanthropy world around the role of technology or the potential role of technology within democracy. And I think we've gone on, on a sort of journey where we were the sort of shiny-eyed Silicon Valley enthusiast back in 2009. I remember talking to colleagues and saying, of course, everybody in Nigeria will have a mobile phone, internet penetration is going to grow exponentially, and then, of course, it will happen that governments will be held to account, people will be waking up in the morning and checking their mobile phones for their national budgets and so on. Of course, that never happened. I mean, one thing that has happened, of course, is the ubiquity of the mobile phone and those connections and so on. Um, and so, and I'll talk a little bit later about some of the positive effects that I think technology has had in democracy. But I think what we're also seeing, and particularly the last couple of years has shown us, has been the negative effects as well, and particularly um, within the sort of technology platforms. Um, <clears throat> so I think in the early years, particularly, I think the Arab Spring was a, a good example as well where there was a lot of, I think, um, enthusiasm around the role that technology could play, both as, a, as an organizer, as a convener of putting people together, of amplifying and putting people in touch with each other that they'd never really had before. But I think even at that, that time, we saw some of the negative effects. The governments very quickly realized that these tools could also be used for surveillance. You, you 
go into one person's Twitter feed, you immediately find out who else they're connected to, and it's very easy then to go and to surveil that whole group. So I think <clears throat> right from the start, there were dangers, and government was also very good at finding ways in which they could tap into those networks. I think what we've seen in the last couple of years is that this has become an art in itself. Um, so I think partly because of the changes in, in business models, um, you know, Shoshana Zuboff in her surveillance capitalism, I think, writes very eloquently about the digital exhaust that is produced by all of us in our, in our online behavior, our searches, and so on. Um, and that sort of behavioral surplus has now become the dominant um, business model for, for Facebook, for Google, for Twitter, and so on. So the idea of which we go back sort of five to 10 years is that these companies were seen as forces for good, I think has disappeared quite quickly. And I think individuals now are much more concerned about their own control and agency over their data. Um, we don't talk about it as ownership. I think that's a misnomer. But I think people now are much more conscious about having to, or willing to, or would like to have control and agency over their own data. Um, <clears throat> and what we've also seen, I think, is, is deliberate misinformation, manipulation, and so on, as we've heard throughout the day today, um, the impact on elections, um, the, the way in which misinformation and disinformation has been spread by social media as well. I think there's a geopolitical angle to this as well, which we're also seeing, um, <clears throat> is that now Russia and China are using these tools to deliberately undermine liberal democracy. Russia, I think, is doing it from a, um, a position of weakness to distract from the weakness in its own economy and so on, and is looking at ways in which can undermine liberal democracy in Europe, in the US, and, and elsewhere. China is looking at it more from um, an economic and a longer game, I think, to try and get countries involved in the Belt and Road Initiative and in a, a much more China-dominant um, economic um, force in the future. But I think what you're also seeing here with China is state surveillance and the, the models of state surveillance now being exported to other countries. <clears throat> Larry Diamond, who we heard from this morning, uh, taught uh, in, in a recent article about uh, the way in which um, Cloudwalk Tech, a Chinese company which um, has exported surveillance um, materials to Zimbabwe, facial recognition um, uh, software, partly to build up its own database of facial rec recognition software, but also to support and export that kind of authoritarian um, surveillance materials to other countries in the developing world as well. So that's a phenomenon that we're now seeing, which we couldn't have, uh, have anticipated maybe five years or so or, or ago. I don't want to give an impression that it's all doom and gloom. Um, where we have seen, um, I think, successes and where we have seen real breakthroughs have been in um, a range of different um, technologies that have been used. I know we have one of our uh, investees here um, from South Africa, Amandla Moby, um, which is a fantastic example of grassroots, um, community-based organizations organizing using mobile phones. 250,000 of them um, in Johannesburg and in other towns who are now using the mobile phones to help people organize um, at, at a community level. Um, <clears throat> we've also seen in Brazil, um, NOSAS, um, which has been written about a lot, um, in Rio and Sao Paulo, which is both combining the offline and the online um, platforms. So online platforms to help people organize, but also offline activity to pressurize government to make changes, whether it's around environmental impact assessments, um, police security, um, helping to avoid school closures and so on. So I think um, what we shouldn't forget is that technology has this massive potential. We are seeing um, examples throughout the world where it is being used as a democratizing force. But of course now, as people become more aware of the, the negative aspects of it, there is this concern, of course, that it is having a, a, a direct um, impact and a very negative impact on, on the democratic discourse and conversation. Okay. Sander, um, in your work uh, in Hungary, you're focused most specifically on anti-corruption efforts, um, and you've found a lot of ways that various uses of digital data and, and digital technologies are helpful to you in doing that work. Tell us a little bit about what the work of K-Monitor and where your 
sitting on this balance of how to you how to design your use of technologies in a way that is de democracy enhancing. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, so a few sentences about the organization. It's a small five people organization which was founded 11 years ago. Um, it, and it started with a tech project. It was about building a database and a map of corruption in Hungary to inform citizens. So very common um, way of you know using technology um, um, in the anti-corruption uh, sector. And since that, I think technology remained always is a key tool for us um, in our operation, not because we always thought that technology will solve the problems, but because we understood somehow that without using technology effectively, we have a much more difficult job to achieve things we want to achieve. And I would like to tell you three areas where uh, I think this is relevant in terms of this context of uh, data and, um, and democracy. Um, <clears throat> One is access to information. Of course, we um, keep working on these very classical ways of you know, opening up government data, opening up uh, spending data to inform citizens to help investigative journalists. We ourselves use algorithmic tools to monitor public procurements, let's say. But besides this very classical approach, um, there are two topics we um, started to engage with, which is, I think, very much showing the risks of technology um, coming in. One is the transparency of algorithms. Um, there was so much spoken about Hungary in the beginning of this conference, so I don't have to give you a, a, a background about the country. Um, we have a, um, an, a government that is getting more and more authoritarian, and it's starting to understand how it can use technology to maintain its power, to do surveillance, looking at citizens, do profiling, and so on. And there's absolutely no legislation on, on what algorithms can do, whether they should be transparent, whether you have access to the source code about who controls their work, whatever. So this is one area we started engaging with, because I think this will become crucial for the, for the next years. Um, another such topic is political and government advertisement on social media. Um, two-thirds of the population are on Facebook, and the government and the government party massively uses Facebook to communicate. And in Hungary, the main source for propaganda are not the Russians, it's our own government. So imagine that fake news, disinformation comes from the government, and um, one primary channel besides their own media is social media. So of course, we sued the Hungarian government to receive information on how much did they spend, what did they spend on how they come campaigns were made, but of course um, it would be much, much easier if Facebook and Google and all these other companies would simply publish this information. I know that there have been steps made in this direction, but I think we are still very far away that this becomes common, and I think this could be a huge problem for many authoritarian leaders if, you know, these data would be um, above all transparent and not uh, NGOs would have to fight for it. Uh, the second topic is, um, and the second issue issue is IT capacities. Um, there are very, very few NGOs who actually know how they can benefit from technology and also what threats technology can mean to them, um, how they could eff more efficiently advocate based on, on, on or do advocacy based on data, but also, you know, how the wrong use and storage of data can actually harm their constituencies. Um, we started a program to do mentoring and workshops uh, uh, for investigative journalists and citizens and, and other NGOs, but we, saw, we, we realized that this is simply not enough because maybe there is a, a, a bit of greater knowledge in this regard, but simply NGOs don't have the capacities and the money to hire a coder or an IT company. It's two, three, four times as expensive to have a tech person in your organization than a regular uh, NGO employee. As far as I know, there is almost no NGO in Hungary that has internal IT capacities. Um, 
And, and the third area is a bit what Stephen mentioned as well in what um, these technologies can mean in empowering citizens and even building communities. Um, we see how powerful business services like Uber or, or Airbnb have become, um, but we simply don't see the tools that would enable, let's say, to create a union of, of uh, taxi drivers or cab drivers or people who simply cannot afford anymore to get a flat in a city for affordable prices because all the flats are now on Airbnb and, and some others making business out of it. Um, and we also saw back you know, to the Hungarian context that this whole democratic backsliding could happen because the democratic institutions did not have a real fundament uh, in, in within you know citizens. Nobody really fe felt ownership about the institutions. So we have to somehow rebuild um, or well, build democracy or at least allow citizens to have democratic experiences. And I think the local level is a very good area where you can contribute to change, even if you have authoritarian um, governments and political forces on the national level, that where you help people to self-organize, to have a say in things that matter to them and show good examples. Because once they see that, you know, here you, the government publishes all kinds of data, they allow us to participate in certain decisions, they will ask themselves why the national government doesn't do it. Why can't we you know, have a say in, 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 in bigger and other things? So to summarize, I think these are three main areas, not only us, but many small NGOs on the ground are dealing with these days when it comes to data and democracy, and I think it very much also shows how you know, we have to deal with both the threats and the opportunities opportunities um, these technologies meet. <clears throat> Thanks, Sandor. And there's an interesting, really important connection that comes out of that story that I think segues to Sean, which is it's a good step to be able to use digital technologies to, to make uh, information more available to individuals, but it's also the legal infrastructure of the access to information knowledge, that whole set of policy domains that also has to be pushed on and changed, uh, perhaps even more so in an age of digital digi digitization of, of, of public information. Sean, in your work to start Digital Public, um, it seems to me, and, and you'll tell the story far better than I can, that part of what you're after is reimagining the technology of the institutions that exist to manage data across its life cycle, sort of from beginning to whatever the end might be, and really think of it um, as, not quite as a commodity, but as, as a resource that needs to be managed with whole new institutional structures within a legal context. Tell us about public, uh, tell us more. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you know one of the things that occurs to me it, it draws a lot on the point that you made initially, which is when we talk about democracy, so often we conflate it with freedom. And so what we think is, oh, it's exciting that we can now do all of these things that we couldn't do before. But democracy is largely about ensuring the things that we do result in the public good through a process of compromise and common participation and control. And I think that kind of common infrastructure of control, this, you know, whether you think of it as networked power or new power um, or as very institutional power, is something that in an age of digitization has changed fundamentally. When we were originally dealing with, whereas you may originally deal with one organization to do something, you are now dealing with them, their digital suppliers, maybe someone in a public-private partnership, the terms of service agreements that kind of chase that all the way down. You may find that one of your partners was acquired halfway through your project, and so their legal infrastructure changed or the terms of their data licensing change. And so all of a sudden, we're, we're moving from the individual unit to sort of almost a supply chain of units and, and figuring out what is the sort of supply chain of our influence. So to Stephen's point, you know, privacy scholarship has in many ways moved from blanket prohibitions on data sharing to ensuring contextual appropriateness of data sharing, right? And GDPR focuses on consent, but also on limited uh, legitimate purpose, which is to say that we agree that there are individual and group interests. And sometimes group interests will trump individual interests. But what we don't have in most sort of digital spaces is the 
infrastructure, whether regulatory, self-regulating, or legal of, of, any, of any stripe, to ensure that we are able to kind of move that promise of agency in a consistent way throughout that supply chain. And so digital public started from that as a problem. And where we came to was looking at trusts. So trusts, for those of you that don't know them, are a thousand-year-old legal tool. They are actually from the UK, uh, started during the Norman invasion. So very <laughs> apropos for reclaiming democracy. Um, and basically what they act as is sort of an organizational power of attorney. So without getting super into it, basically what happens is you put a kind of asset into a trust. Now that might be data, it might be money, it might be the right to use data in a particular circumstance, and then you bring people in to govern how that will be used or how that might go forward. Now, what you find, and I think that one of the most interesting revelations since we've started working in digital public, is that we are all digital political scientists. <laughs> but whether you know it or not, you are a data governor. Now, if you've never thought about yourself that way, you are probably a data autocrat. <laughs> <laughs> And if you spend a lot of time thinking about how you, do, how you do that, you share only with a couple of people, you make sure it is for things that you want, you're probably a data plutocrat. <laughs> and then if you built the organizational infrastructure to adjudicate disputes, to bring on decision-making authority from outside organizations, and to meaningfully interact in a way that promotes the sort of interests of your community in the way that your digitization decisions are made, then you're probably getting closer to this idea of recl reclaiming some form of democracy through technology. But it's, to your point, it's, it's not about money, but it is very much about tracing our relationships and how it is that we build common expectations and sort of enforcement through mutuality of the promises that we make to each other in digital relationships. So in talking about democracy, leaving aside the digital for just one second, um, all three of you have talked sort of interspersed about the responsibilities of people, which is a big part of a democratic system, and the respons responsibilities of legal systems or sort of institutions. So I want to break that into a two-part question for each of you, starting again with Stephen. What is it that Luminate most thinks in the individuals in this room, people around the world, need to be able to do in order for us to use digital technologies for democracy? What is, the, what is people's responsibility? Part one of the question to each of you. <coughs> well, I mentioned um, in my opening remarks about the, I think the, what's changed over the last couple of years, particularly, I think in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica scandal and various other um, <coughs> sort of in, uh, abuses of, of, of power and data and technology, I think is people are now much more aware around what control they have mm -hmm. over their own digital footprints over their own data and so on. Um, so I think one of the, the things that we need to think about now and one of the things that we're advocating as an organization is a data bill of rights. Okay. So what that will mean is greater transparency over who controls your data. So you know, at the moment, we, you know, we're all aware of the, you know, the consent where we scroll down and we tick the box and then, then off we go. I've read, that, read them. Yeah. Well, I think there was, I heard there was an experiment where one company actually offered a $1,000 reward or something, I think, at the end. If, uh, if you don't have any idea how many times you've signed away your children. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so I think um, there is now much more awareness of that. Um, so people, I think, are much more concerned. And obviously, we've seen, you know, abuses from, you know, where, um, you know, even to, to the, the, you know, the tragic events in Christchurch where technology has been used in... Tra in tragic and terrible ways. And I think the sort of the uses and abuses of, of people's data and information, people are much more aware of now. So, so one thing is around transparency, the second is around privacy, and the third is around competition. And I think there is now a much greater move, which I saw you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg sort of mentioned the other day around, they are open to regulation. So this this kind of um, you know, the, the the work that needs to be done to to both regulate the platforms and also potentially to break them up, I think is is something that is now is is becoming much more to the forefront. Okay, so that that's getting sort of toward the second end of my question. Okay. So we'll come back to part two. But Sean, what is it that people need to be able to do differently? What do we need to understand, or what is it that we all need to make sure we know if we don't know it already? 
Uh, I think it's the old wisdom around if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I think we've been going fast for a while. And I think we're really learning you know, how solitary and, and in some ways how com competitive that has become and investing in um, harmonization and going together, you know, focusing on adoption over newness, over representation, over um, being the first to pilot or, you know, being the first person to write your list of principles. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, we've, we've, we've got principles now. You're, you're so I think we can, uh, no, but I mean, I, mean I, I think really seriously, it's, it's a, it is a sea change a little bit in the way that many of us are primed right. into the space. And I think it is yep. extraordinarily difficult to hold the space to figure out who your coalition is before you take that next step. Sandor, what about for you? I think it's still, we need a lot of, lot of education in this regard. I mean, I think a lot of us are still not aware of, you know, how data affects our lives, um, what threats they mean. So I think we're at super basic level. Uh, there is a lot of technology and a lot of knowledge out there for very few. Yeah. And for the many, it's still like, I mean, imagine if you buy a microwave oven, you have a, a, a user's manual yeah. and, and, and you, you get at least the basics to understand, you know, what the threat are if you use this machine. And I think also there, there should be, if it, even if, if it comes to regulation, I think there should be plain language in explaining when you register on a social media platform that would explain not like a long legal text, but you know, this and this and this data of you will be shared with these people, and this can happen to you if you go on the platform. And so, so this is just one example, but mm -hmm. I think we are really at the basis of you know, explaining these issues to many. That's great. So then, so with that list of changes for democratic citizens or citizens to be able to participate in a democracy in a digital age, what are the structural changes that you're looking for? And the Bill of Rights is a little bit of both, but um, what else is Luminate pushing for that's either a structural or a regulatory rethink or an institutional innovation? I mean, I think the greater scrutiny and oversight of platforms is is something that's that's kind of you know hugely needed, um, and I think you know GDPR is a start, mm -hmm. but I think there is also you know pot the potential also to help other governments to navigate this 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 field. Um, I mean, for example, you know we work in Myanmar, um, and of course you know we we've we've heard you know in, in many examples of where hate speech has been amplified by Facebook in Myanmar. Now the government there wants to do something about it, but is terribly, you know, is, is hopelessly ill-equipped. Um, and I think the danger of, the, the, and civil society organizations in the country have expressed this to, 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 to us and to, to others, is that you know, one of their fears is that government then uses this as a tool for censorship. So you've got this kind of, uh, the, the, the tension between freedom of speech, but then also regulation which will help to avoid some of the abuses and, and excesses that we've seen. So I wrote an article that was published in November of last year uh, in Foreign Policy, which essentially centered around a term called digital politique. So it's digital politique, right? Um, it is the idea that these are all contested spaces. And so to so much of what I see happen in conversations around regulation, around antitrust, around particular things that we all are concerned about in one form or another, these aren't things where the institutional powers exist to necessarily do that, or that we necessarily want them to. So on the one hand, it may, you know, you may or may not, for example, agree with European regulators that any of the American five, big, big five, must be broken up. It is a completely separate question of what happens when a European regulator is able to go in and dismantle an American company, right? Like, as, a, as an expression of authority. And I think that we have to be really clear with ourselves about when we are passing new laws or requesting new regulation or ascribing to new statements of, pers of you know, whether it's law or, or any, any of the forms of sort of behavioral regulation that we're talking about inside of digital spaces, we're not just asking, how do we want to change your behavior? We're asking, who do we want to have the authority to change your behavior? And you know, part of your point earlier, I think, about Russia and China and certainly the EU, I mean, 
mean, there are a number of now philosophies essentially emerging for how data and digital rights should play out on the internet. And the tensions are not just do we agree or disagree. It's not just are we going to get kind of the most votes together. It's that these are very sort of existential philosophies about exercise of power in contested spaces. And I think that, so, you know, to answer the question, I think that institutions, you know, are already starting to look at how can they disproportionately compete, you know, how can they maximize the power of their advantages, which is a natural assumption, but so much of what is already starting to happen, for example, with GDPR is the one-stop shop, this idea that Europe will go together is starting to fray in implementation. You're starting to see the French courts and Ger German antitrust regulators, among many other, you know, Ireland as a, uh, Ireland's DPA has certainly granted some interesting interesting authorities across the continent. And th so there is just this, these are all contested spaces. And so I think at the institutional level, what I'm hoping is that we will include more of the power dynamics explicitly in the conversations that we have about policy uh, in a way that I, I generally mm -hmm. don't see us sort of including it as, yes, we agree that this company is doing something wrong or something right, but no, I do or do not think, you know, yes, I, yes or no, I think that this authority should be the one to step in. Yeah. Sander? Yeah, I think there is not a single solution. It's, I think, very similar to if you look at the times when, you know, social rights were established and everybody knew that there is a problem that workers have no rights, but nobody knew, or many said that they knew what the solution is, but at the end it were many different ways that led to the development of worker rights. And I think it's a bit similar in regards that we don't know what's the best solution and I'm not sure that there is a solution that works for every situation. There can be uh, situations where local legislation or a country's legislation can solve one problem. Sometimes you need regional solution and GDPR is kind of going in this way. And then you would need also like global standards to de be de developed in, in this regard. And it's also about the actors. Of course, it's governments and international institutions that can play a role here. Also, the tech companies, you know, have to be forced to do kind of self-regulation. Not sure that this would be the solution, but why <laughs> not experimenting with this and working on this as well? And also empower citizens and support, you know, civil society that somehow brings together people in um, stepping up for their uh, their own rights uh, when it comes to data or when it comes to um, social media. I'm not sure that you know once there will be a, a union of Facebook users that can you know um, force. Mark Zuckerberg to do this or that, but at least if you know there there are attempts to to gather those users of Facebook or those who have their data on Google or Facebook and all the other companies, that's again an interesting way. So I think we have to experiment with these approaches and we'll see what works better and, and what doesn't work. Well, and just in case it wasn't complicated enough, that is, as you've all three pointed out, We've got a set of global challenges and we don't have a global rulemaking mechanism. That's an oversimplified way of, of pointing to what you've said. Is my last question before we go to the audience, again, a two-part question. Um, we've all pointed to, well, people need to do things differently, governments need to do things differently, the tech companies need to do something differently. What about us? What if philanthropies, philanthropists, nonprofits, civil society organizations, it, it, it seems um, illogical that they can just continue to function the way we've been functioning for however long we've been around when everything else is in so much turmoil. So what do philanthropists need to be able to think about differently or do differently, civil society organizations? And I mean this on any one of at least two levels. One is sort of within their own organization, so whether that's about data governance or um, digital literacy skills, or I mean collectively and their contribution in the space and it, what it's supposed to hold for democracy. How do we think about that? What do, what do we need to do differently to use digital data, digital technologies in support of democracy and not in pursuit of efficient document management? which we're all getting better at, I'm sure. 
I mean, I think there's, for us, one of the things that we are sort of much more aware of now <coughs> is our responsibilities to our investees or our mm. grantees in, in developing countries, particularly and in authoritarian regimes, to provide them with um, digital security training mm -hmm. um, and also to be respectful of how we manage their data mm -hmm. as well. Because I think unwittingly, you know, and of course, you know, we've, there's, there's been many uh, examples of where organizations have been hacked, um, data can go astray, data can be leaked and so on, and if we are working with human rights defenders and people who are in vulnerable positions, we need to, I think, really up our own game in terms of how we manage their data, but also how we equip them with the skills to protect themselves mm -hmm. as well, because I think there are still many organizations there that, that don't have those, and it's sometimes costly to, to put in encryption and, and so on, but those are the kind of things they need to think about. So is that, I'm just is that an ongoing set of relationships then and something you're budgeting for because Indeed. it's, it's it yeah. goes on forever. It's not tick the box, now you know Absolutely. security and great. Yeah. And then, just, sorry, just on, on the what can philanthropists do, yep. um, <clears throat> I mean, I think collectively this is, um, uh, you know, both in terms of putting pressure on the platforms, on government and so on, we co-fund with many other organizations, many of them who are in this room, with OSF, with Hewlett, MacArthur and so on. There is, I think, a joint collective um, responsibility the, and, and also an opportunity to put pressure on platforms and on governments in the countries which we work. So that advocacy and policy Precisely. influence role specifically around the digital political economy, exactly. if you will. Great. Sean? Uh, I, you know, the easiest, well, the <laughs> The easiest answer to say is diligence, right? And I think that one of the one of the earliest parts of this is recognizing, you know, we talk about uh, ourselves as indicative or, or recognizing of good practice, but we started this by saying, you know, 10 years ago, we were probably all people who would have been like, the problem. Uh, and so, you know, I think, you know, my, uh, and so I think that a lot of what we need to invest in is one, um, longer time horizons, right? So the things that you create during the life of your grant or the life of your philanthropy will live on both uh, as a potential source of value and as a potential source of the sort of data trash island that is living in the middle of the world. Uh, and we need to kind of figure out how we're positioning people that we support and empower to play a positive role in, in that process and in determining what, what those assets may turn into, whether they're you know, values or liabilities. And I think that the second piece I would say is, um, you know, that philanthropy in a lot of really interesting ways is sort of models giving, a, giving away resources, giving away some form of agency. Now, Lots, lots in the details there. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, we're now at this moment which is also very interesting and that's happening around data. Is it's, what do I need? What can I share? What can I share in a competitive way and in a non-competitive way? And just a, a, a final sort of idea here is um, I, I, the idea of a confidence interval. So for those of you that are not deeply mathematical, nor am I, uh, a confidence interval is essentially it's an indication of how much confidence you should put in a particular solution based on how well you know the variables, how clean and high quality your data, and how complete your, the information that you have to make a decision is, or how, and how effective your sort of implementation arm is. Data, or confidence intervals in digital systems, in particular in, particularly in data governance and digital policy, are something that is largely underexplored. And I think that we have this idea that any data is some data is good data, and forgotten in many instances Mark Twain's very pithy response to that. So I would just offer this idea that when we see you know, the emergence of data as affecting democracy, the first thing that we should do is interrogate the confidence interval. Um, I read a talk from the, from the small civil society organization perspective. I think what we can do is try somehow to move forward in this situation, and for us it means um, find partners. Um, as I said, the civil society sector is very, you know, uh, underfunded or has very little capacities when it comes to tech, especially small organizations, so what we started to do is build a volunteer community of tech people, data people, IT companies that um, 
give away resources in their free time, in their free capacities to support civil society organizations. And of course, it's not an easy job because just simply having a coder doesn't mean that you know you get a problem done, but you know, build this community of, of, of people who are able to manage projects, who can actually write a code and who know about the problem that you know has to be solved because often you know techies come with whatever ideas, but it simply doesn't resonate with reality or what you know the organizations on the ground are facing. So for us the importance is somehow to solve this situation by building this uh, communities of, of, of practice on the ground. <clears throat> It's wonderful, thank you. And it, it shows the evolution even there. While it may not, um, it, there's still a great need for philanthropic support of a, the kind of tech functionality, the security trainings and that. There's also this larger understanding of what the resource is capable of and the political economy in which it exists, which strikes me as a, organization-wide set of understandings, not just something you can depend on if you're lucky enough to have one, Bob the IT guy, right? It's a much more complex set of questions. Uh, I know we're supposed to open this up for questions. I don't know if there are mics in the audience, um, nor can I actually see you very well, but um, I see a hand, two hands right here. So the gentleman right here, hold on one second while the guy brings you a mic. Uh, I'm Peter Eigen, I'm the founder of Transparency International. Uh, you have raised the questions earlier, who should be entrusted with yeah. the responsibility to regulate um, uh, information technology. Let me share with you our experience when fighting international corruption. 25 years ago, we had exactly the same problem. Uh, nation states were unable to deal with international corruption Everybody was participating, allowing their own citizens to bribe everywhere in the world, including Germany and so on. And it uh, took a small NGO at the time, probably as small as yours in Hungary right now, um, to basically create a multi-stakeholder approach mm -hmm. to this issue. And, uh, and now international corruption is prohibited. It doesn't, uh, it's not... Uh, extinct yet, but it's uh, <laughs> prohibited. Uh, and, um, and I think my answer would be very similar to the question who should be entrusted to deal uh, with the primacy of politics over the market in uh, information technology. Um, uh, and my answer would be uh, this is a clearly an issue of global governance, mm -hmm. which cannot be solved uh, at the national, at the regional, yeah. at the communal level. Everybody has to contribute to it. And um, uh, at the global governance level, we have to recognize that nation states have lost their capacity to take this role. I mean, there are at least three sort of uh, asymmetries, uh, one in terms of global reach, where the states simply don't have the reach they need in order to deal with the large companies. Um, there's the question of the time horizon, which has been uh, raised earlier in the discussion, where the decision makers at the national level, in particular in democracies, have to think of maintaining power uh, during the electoral periods of three, four, five years. Uh, and when you deal with uh, climate change, for instance, as you, the previous panel did, uh, this is not a matter of three, four, five years, this is a matter of generations. So the whole time horizon of the decision makers and the issues uh, they have to deal with uh, is totally out of whack. And the third one, of course, the incredible diversity of the constituencies of uh, um, uh, the power at the national level. So our answer to that, and I think we can look back at a very positive experience, is a powerful role of civil society organizations. And uh, that is exactly a role which we are presently losing. Uh, <laughs> limited space, you know, uh, harassment, imprisonment, uh, killing of uh, civil society activists, and, uh, uh, and also a question of how one can fund civil society in a way without destroying their independence, yeah. destroying their credibility. So I think if the uh, philanthropic community could focus on addressing these two issues, uh, trying to counteract the limiting space and helping to create a sort of basic funding uh, provision for uh, 
eligible civil society organizations. That would be a very powerful way of dealing also with the governance in the information technology. Thank you. Um, there, there wasn't a question in there, but I'll ask a question related to the comments, which is that um, how do you each think about the roles that digital technologies are you being are playing in being used to close civic space? We talk about these things as if they're parallel, but uh, if you just think about internet shutdowns, there's a very easy example there. But I'm curious in your um, in your day work if if that relationship has factored into the way you think about either funding civil society organizations or structuring yourselves as one. I mean, I think the thing I mentioned earlier on is about, um, you know, China's role in exporting surveillance um, is, is another example. Plus also the whole issue of social credit scores, yeah. which is now becoming a phenomenon, which is also now being exported as well. So I think there is that w alternative, um, uh, alternative means of social media, alternative means of engagement, the use of social media and technology as a surveillance tool, I think, is, is something to be concerned about. Sean or Sander? Surveillance is moving a lot faster, and they're able to do it alone. It's, I sort of, generally speaking, try not to give too many examples in public because of how terrifying it mm -hmm. is. Yeah. Just today, two of the largest credit rating agencies in the United States announced a partnership to improve our data products, which went really well the first time Equifax tried. I think that part of what we have to figure out is how we deal with two-sided markets. So much of what we're talking about is as data as an object. And so much of what we actually are concerned about is how data gets used. So, you know, the social credit scoring system, there's a lot of apprehension because of how little influence there is over how to make sure that it is a good thing. And at the same time, I'd imagine that quite a few people in this room are invested in digital IDs, right? And digital ID systems are a precursor to credit scoring systems, if not, you know, directly involved. And so I think that so much of what we're talking about focuses on step one, and because step one is so big and so hard that we really struggle to get to step two or step three or step four, and that's, you know, to your point about time horizons, you know, and it's also to your point, a lot of the things that we're talking about in terms of what people should do come from the need to invest in the foundations of awareness and capacity and agency to operate in a, in a space, and that those are not things that data inevitably produces. Right, absolutely not. Did you want to jump in, or? Um, no, I think it's, I, I, I completely agree with what said. <laughs> okay, there's another question right here in the middle also, please. Thank you, uh, Chris Taggart from Open Corporates. Um, I haven't heard as much as I thought I might do about uh, sort of these conglomerations of data, big data being pulled together and the power that that generates and the, the, the fact that the, the access is increasingly being limited. You know, they have this concept of, of data gravity where you have black holes of data and um, once you've got that, the data is automatically already is, all, is, is uh, like sucked in by the gravitational pull. <laughs> that data is actually probably not useful to anyone else unless you've got these other 50 data sets that's being there. And I just wondered about the, the relationship about, uh, between massive amounts of data that's been collected by, by some of the biggest companies and, and, and other organizations too in, in, in the world. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and the implications of that, and actually how some of the regulations that we're putting in may even strengthen that. So, you know, so right to be forgotten is essentially something that says you only get to play in this game if you have this entire, these huge call centers and these huge processes in terms of doing this. Facebook is now, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is now calling for some sort of regulation. Now, of course, he means the regulation that he would like, but almost certainly that regulation would one that would be strengthening their position in the market and, sure. and making it more difficult for competitors. And so access to information, I know obviously from Sandor, Sandor the, you know, getting access to things like the Hungarian company register data is, is, is really challenging and you can't do proper investigations without that. So just in terms of the relationship between, uh, talking a little bit about the relationship between large data sets and the power that brings and the asymmetries of, of power that is, uh, that is being hardened in, in society in a way. Thank you. Um, I mean, 
this is, I think, very similar to as it was like years back, that there is this constant asymmetry and it's in some way growing because, you know, the amount of data collected and produced is growing and there's always something new and we're always in a reactive mode, right? We're always lagging behind, we're always some steps behind and sometimes it's getting more steps. Um, so I think, and, and I think that uh, you mentioned company registry data, the, the example of that shows how long it can take. You know, it, it's 10 years since, you know, organizations such as ours started to advocate for, you know, have data on beneficial ownership, have company registry data completely opened up, whatever, because it's, it's, it's a must for uh, anti-corruption work and investigation, but I think also a super important tool for, for businesses in, you know, looking up other companies and and, and, and regarding trust and so on. And it really took legislation 10 years to you know, move at the point where we would say, okay, that's a success. And it will take another two, three years until this is um, enforced. So I think this is a huge problem coming back to the time frame that, that the way how we work and advocate and how politics work is still too slow compared how quickly technology is evolving and how quickly this whole space is, is moving and I think if we don't you know find ways to be quicker and more responsive or proactive we'll just keep always going behind uh, what what's happening in this regard yeah I, I I think it's such an interesting question about sort of the size of data because on the one hand that presumes that more data is relevant because people care about the facts and the certainty of the thing right if you are pulling a trigger with a very good data set and pulling a trigger with no data at all, the quality, what you do, what happens once you've pulled that trigger is still the most important thing. And I think that we really uh, struggle with figuring out kind of how we manage what used to be a very clear thing, which was more makes more sense, into Lucy's sort of opening point, data is not money, data is not value, and that Actually, in a lot of instances, the bigger your data set, the bigger your risk, like your risk profile and surface. I think so much of what we, so much of my concern around unbundling and this idea of moving into supply chains is that we externalize so many of our commitments to or accountability to the public good. And data size is part of that, but it is also, there's also this idea that we're going to know the threats that are available based on a, a, a set of data. And I think that what we have to do is get involved in adaptive threat modeling because it is impossible to know at the point of any individual data release the universe of data that all of your potential adversaries may not only have right now, but may have in perpetuity going forward. And so we have to move from this, we have to get it, in my opinion, I think we need to move from we need to get it right right now to we need to start investing in the foundations that enable us to correct going forward. All, uh, which absolutely assumes a, an understanding of the pervasiveness and permanence of this digital connected reality, which I find it's still amazing to me how many people and institutions in civil society and philanthropy think that like, if you don't have a Twitter account, you're not in the digital world. It's like, give that one up. <laughs> I'm wondering if you have thoughts on the asymmetry. <clears throat> um, I mean, not particularly in, in, in to, to, to add on, on what Sandor and, and, and Sean said. I think going back to one of the things that Sandor mentioned earlier on, which I think is related to this, is, is around algorithmic accountability. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously with the advances of, of artificial intelligence, the way in which algorithms are now making decisions about things like sentencing, credit scoring, a whole range of different things, and there is no set of ethics around that and there are no frameworks or governance of you know who makes those decisions who sets those boundaries and so on and i think this is another example and we're going to wrap up i'll give each of you a chance to to say a, a few parting words but it 
what I would hope is that as the philanthropic and civil society starts to think more about algorithms and their use in decision making, that we don't repeat the cycle we did with data itself, right? The same sort of, maybe it's a time horizon question, maybe it's something different, but this sense of both unbridled enthusiasm to unbridled fear um, and trying to find our way. And again, I think it comes down to understanding what it is we're talking about. If you're thinking about democracies as a system of governance in which the people have the power to scrutinize the decisions, algorithms are undemocratic, period and stop. <laughs> so um, with that, uh, I'm sorry we don't have time for more questions. Sandor, just to mix things up, if you have um, thoughts on sort of the, the key, the key I, element of thinking about digital technology and democracy that drives you, your work. I think it's curiosity because it's such an interesting area and I think it, it has so much impact on whatever we do. I think we need simply to experiment a lot and you know try new ways, continuously try and you know I would if, if I may encourage you to invest in all kinds of activities that might be interesting and not just following trends because I think civil society is often suffering from donors having a belief in some narrative for a few years then the global narrative changes change and you know it organizations have to follow these trends and and I think be just much more flexible in, in experimenting because there is no single solution we never know the solution and who knows um, what will come out at the end I believe your grantees I don't know I, you know a lot of for a lot of us like these were issues that we were looking at practice and thinking gosh they're this this will probably turn into something, and you know, we were wrong sometimes too, of course. But you know, I think that there is this interesting kind of. There's a lot of uphill convincing that um, the realities on the ground or in the law or wherever else um, are are what they are, and I think you know so much of what we found in, in my own sort of work both at Frontline SMS and then moving into digital public in some ways has been that it's the, it's not, you, you can really find the limits of technology very quickly if what you're trying to do is change power. And uh, that what, we, what we're talking about is building an experimentation enabling environment that doesn't, that does not continue to disproportionately harm the vulnerable. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think we have come to the realization that technology is a tool, it's not a solution, and of course, like any media, whether it's from the printing press to radio, it can be used for nefarious means as well as good. Um, I still remain a tech optimist, but I'm much more aware, I think, now of the dangers for weaponization. Yeah, wonderful. Join me in thanking Sandor, Sean, and Stephen. Mm -hmm. I have the privilege of introducing the next uh, part of the program. I uh, ask you all to please now give your attention to Mr. Antoine Hunter. He's a Bay Area native. Mr. Hunter is an award-winning African-American deaf producer, choreographer, film and theater actor, dancer, dance instructor, wait, wait, there's more, model, poet, speaker, mentor, and advocate for the deaf. Using a combination of movement and sign language, Mr. Hunter performs powerful interactive work that explores how, even without words, we can create a culture focused on solutions simply by listening to others. different, different culture, and wow, to continue teaching about deaf culture is still not being recognized around the world. We're still learning about what that means, the power of communication around you, verbal communication. But let me introduce to myself again. Put your hand on like that. Make an A. Put it over. And one. That's me. Yes. <laughs> When I was growing up, many people were just looking down at me saying that deaf people can't do anything. Like the world 
with nothing. I felt really alone that I felt I had no part in the world that I felt like I couldn't connect. I felt disconnected. I wanted to connect. I wanted to have a place in the world to be with you, 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 and you. I came to the place where I felt like I'm in the world. Nobody wants me to be a part of it. How do I get myself out in the world? They came out of standing. I started, they didn't understand me. I spoke, they didn't understand me. But it was till then. People got to understand me a little bit better. Yeah. If you put your hand like this, you put it right here. Oh. Now, what do you think that means? That one? Okay. I won't tell you what it means now. But what it try this. Put your hand here. Ah. Now, which one is more intense? Which side is more intense? This one or this one? That one. Okay. And this one just was a lie, right? Whoa, fear. That's the sign for fear. The sign for understanding. Fear and understanding, two different things, right? So when people don't understand something, they get scared. When something is new, they get scared. It becomes stressful on the mind. But when you start to understand, it's like a light bulb. Come down. And it's still E. Ladies and gentlemen, they decided to come time one to create a buck, buck, buck. You come over here, you come over here, you come over here. I'm here to tell you, it doesn't have to be that way. You can tell the world who you are, and then the world's trying to tell you who you are. I tell the world I'm deaf and I'm beautiful. That's who I am. Yeah, let me be beautiful, be connected with many of you. I'm you, you, and you. If you put your hand like that, then you go. Yeah. And have a different way to communicate, even though it's different from yours. Come and learn, and it will be beautiful to you. How did that dare? That's really, really simple. We're really smart, yeah? We know how to count to four. How many 
Let me teach the mechanic with four. One, two, three, four. It's just like that. Try it with me. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now take it back. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now drop. We'll move to the side. Hey, that's called rhythm. Yeah. Now, that's a sign for C O L D, cold. Now, remember that sign? What's the sign for it? Cold. I want you to do cold four times. Looks like what? Cold, 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 cold. Yeah? Can you do it? Yeah? One, two, three, four. Cold, cold, cold. Go, go, one, two, three, four. Go, 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 one, two, three, four. Go, 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 go. Mm, you guys should be in my dad company, good. Yeah, what's the sign for A O T? Anybody know A S O T? Ah, she was like, huh? Okay, there you go. Yeah, but if you put your hand like this, Ha, 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 ha. Four times. Yeah. One, two, three, four. And ha, 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 ha. Go one, two, three, four. And ha, 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 ha. One more time. Two, three, four. And ha, 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 ha. Mmm, not bad. With my deaf community, when we come up with some cool moment, we always challenge ourselves. To improve. So for a cold, for a hot, can you do it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Here we go. One, two, three, four. And cold, 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 cold. And hot, 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 hot. And cold, 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 cold. And hot, 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 hot. And cold, 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 cold. And hot, hot. Uh, one more time, and cold, 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 and hot, 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 hot. Now move, and move my rhythm, and move my rhythm, and move my rhythm. That can dance. The world can dance. Thank you.